Hey everybody, man, I, I, we have only been at Petersburg a short time shooting videos and I've already stood at something like six places uh, I've never even been before. And this is probably my 40th trip to Petersburg or so. So this is just great going around with our good friend, Will Green. Now, what we are doing here is we, we've already explored thoroughly. You've probably seen the first offensive, the stuff June 15th through the 18th. And now we're gonna get into the second offensive that people know a little bit less about, but the union still thinks it has an opportunity to maybe you know cut communications, get into Petersburg. So Will, where are we and what's going on? Thanks, Gary. It's good to be with you again. We're standing at the edge of Confederate Battery 36, which was part of that Damoc line of defenses around Petersburg, the 10-mile line that had 55 artillery batteries numbered sequentially from downstream or east of Petersburg around to the south side where we are now and then swinging around to the south and to the west where Battery 5 anchored on the Appomattox River above Petersburg. We're here at Battery 36, and the reason that we're here is this feature that you can see behind me. Now, this looks like a lake, and it is an artificial lake now, uh, called Wilcox Lake, named after the Wilcox Farm, which was uh, General Mahone's headquarters uh, during June of 1864. The lake wasn't here, but the deep ravine that I hope you can see on camera was here, drained by a stream called Lieutenant Run, which ran into the Appomattox River. And the significance of this ravine is that it provided the gateway, the avenue for two major successful flank attacks by the Confederates led by William Mahone. Now, many of you know William Mahone, a little guy, five feet, one inches tall, barely weighed 100 pounds, was slightly wounded early in the war. His wife was told it was only a flesh wound and she responded by saying, well, it must be serious for William has no flesh. Uh, one of uh, his soldiers described Mahone as a small man, talks very fine and is ugly enough to scare any set of men that did not know him. He is very sociable and will talk with a private as quick as he would a lieutenant general. He was much liked by his men. And by the time of the Petersburg campaign, Mahone was kind of the go-to guy for Robert E. Lee. His division of, of five brigades were the shock troops of the Army of Northern Virginia at Petersburg. Now, Grant's second offensive, June 22nd and 23rd, 1864, was comprised of three different components. The first was a huge cavalry raid led by James Wilson and August V. Couts, designed to destroy all the Confederate railroads from the Weldon Railroad to the Southside Railroad to the Richmond and Danville Railroad to cut off Lee's supply. That was a, that's a different story. It was a long, exciting raid, which didn't wind up too well for Wilson. The second component was an attempt by the Army of the James to make a foothold on the north side of the James River at Deep Bottom. That was successful and the Federals did establish their toehold on the north side of the James at Deep Bottom, which would lead to a number of different offensives north of the James. But the major portion of the second offensive was General Grant's effort to interdict the, both the Petersburg and Weldon Railroad and the Southside Railroad in what I think is a rather geographical ludicrous attempt to make that huge swing to the west with only two corps, the Sixth Corps and the Second Corps. Now, there hasn't been a real book written about the Second Offensive, so it's kind of difficult to find out a lot of information. I have a chapter or two on it in my book, Campaign of Giants. But in a nutshell, what the idea is, is the Sixth Corps is going to go to the south and to the west, the Second Corps is going to go to the north and the west, and their design is to move as far to the west to break these railroads as possible. Very quickly, the 6th Corps and the 2nd Corps lose contact with one another. The 6th Corps is very timid in its advance. The 2nd Corps doesn't go much farther than what the 6th Corps goes to. And by the afternoon of June 22nd, the 2nd Corps, now commanded by David Burney because Winfield Hancock is uh, suffering from his Gettysburg wound, uh, his left flank, Burney's left flank, is exposed about a mile and a half behind me, a mile and a half to the south of us. General Lee, this is, there's a debate about who really orchestrates, who really initiates this attack. Mahone says he's the one who has the idea. Others say it was Lee's idea. Lee ordered Mahone to do this. Irrespective of that, Mahone gets the assignment to take three of his brigades to move secretly down this ravine where he can't be seen. And that will lead him around the left flank 
of Bernie's second core, which is in the air because it's not connected with the sixth core. And that's exactly what Mahone does on June 22nd. This is one of the most amazing offensives of the Civil War that nobody knows anything about because Mahone has three brigades. He has his Georgia Brigade uh, under, uh, under a man named William Gibson. He has his Alabama Brigade under John C. C. Sanders, and he has his old Virginia Brigade under David Whissaker. Three brigades, and he's going to attack the three divisions of the Second Corps. And he moves down this ravine, he pops out of the defilade of this ravine, he attacks the Second Corps, and sequentially rolls up nine of the ten brigades in that corps captures more than 1,700 men, inflicts more than 600 casualties of killed and wounded on the Second Corps, captures the first battery the Second Corps loses in the Civil War, and pushes almost all the way to the Jerusalem Plank Road. Three brigades destroying almost three divisions of the Union Second Corps. The most shameful day of the Second Corps history. But Mahone finally runs out of gas near the end of the day. He brings up his Mississippi Brigade. They cover his withdrawal back to the main Confederate line. And the uh, Second Corps is basically out of action as far as this offensive is concerned. The postscript to all of this, there's another attack the next day on June the 23rd, uh, led by Wilcox's brigade as well as more of William Mahone's brigade down along the railroad where the Sixth Corps has stopped and that attack rolls up a portion of the Sixth Corps as well, and the second Union offensive is, uh, is ended in disaster, absolute disaster. One postscript to the story here, this same ravine will be the axis of advance for another attack by William Mahone's division, portion of his division. This will take place two months later on August the 19th, and this is the successful Confederate counterattack at the Battle of the Weldon Railroad or Globe Tavern on August the 19th, in which Mahone captures 2,700 Union troops using with, with three brigades. Another amazing assault. But in this case, Mahone doesn't really drive the Federals back. And a couple of days later, as we'll talk about in another video, uh, the Federals will redeem the situation. <laughs> That's great, Will. This is so cool. And I, I, four things real quick, if I can remember four things, which is a rarity, I assure you. One, um, just the idea here that Will would characterize only two corps of, what, 30,000 soldiers, maybe upwards of 40,000, as, as ludicrously insufficient, really speaks to the scale of the campaigns for Petersburg. I mean, we're talking about a lot of troops here, too. He also talked about the uh, how... Uh, you know, this campaign is characterized, and it's been for a while, not for the whole time for the South, but Confederate brigades against Union divisions, Confederate divisions against Union Corps, and consistently using interior lines at Petersburg, Lee is throwing one or two divisions against one or two Union Corps, and somehow it works, you know, at least holds off um, for 292 days in total. Three, you know, make sure when you get a chance, volume one of, of Will's three volume series from uh, UNC Press is already out, a campaign of giants. Volume two, before too long, I don't want to make any promises here, and then volume three, so, so we're going to have a great great opportunity to really understand this stuff. And fourth, and finally, at least for me, um, Doug, Doug Allman behind the camera. I mean, while we walked out here for a quarter mile or so, there were works on one or both sides of our path the whole way. We could go further. There's works all over. This is the battery here, and, and the moat is next to it over here. It, it never shows up on camera as well. But trust me, these are incredible works. And yet, I've never stood here till today. I've never seen it as part of the park tour route, and I may already know why, but let me pretend why. I can't figure this out. <laughs> let me pretend otherwise. I can't figure this out, Will. Straighten out. Why isn't this park land? Well, this is all still preserved, Gary, uh, but it used to be part of the National Battlefield, which originally was called Petersburg National Military Park. Many of, uh, of your viewers are familiar with the Antietam Plan of land acquisition in the 1920s. Uh, Fredericksburg in Spotsylvania was acquired that way, uh, and so was Petersburg, in which, in order to save money, the government simply bought the lines of fortifications and then built a tour road next to them, rather than buying the whole battlefield under the premise that uh, the land would always be rural and there was no need to buy all that extra land. So that's how this land came into the National Park Service. 
Uh, however, by the early 1970s, the park administration here at Petersburg got tired of investigating traffic accidents and other law enforcement issues along the tour roads out here. Uh, and in, in order to uh, uh, shed themselves of that responsibility, they struck a deal with the city of Petersburg by which they would donate their land out here to the city with a protective easement on the earthworks so that they would be uh, devoid of any responsibility for law enforcement activity. So what we have here is a city park uh, with preserved earthworks, not as well interpreted as they might be by the Park Service, but at any rate, they are preserved, but they are not part of the park anymore. Thanks, Will. And, you know, make no mistake, the American Battlefield Trust, we deal with this with some frequency. I mean, you know, do we hang on to land? Do we transfer it to another entity? Usually to the Park Service. We feel great about that. Usually state entity, we feel great. Sometimes private entities. And we make sure we put reverters in there where if they ever, you know, can't protect the land anymore that we get it back. But, you know, do you put a road in? Do you provide signage? Do you put a parking area in that might disturb some historic things if you can't put it anywhere else? These are decisions that every land steward of battlefields have to go through. There's no perfect answer a lot of the time. So um, I appreciate all of that, Will. Uh, we'll see you at another place before long. Thank you, Will. Thanks, Doug. And thank you for supporting Battlefield Preservation and Education.